I'm Jason Ernst. I'm a professor here at UCLA in biological chemistry, computer science, and computational medicine. Um, so if you were here during the short program uh, the first week, I told you about a certain set of um, epigenomic approaches that we've worked on. Um, I want to now talk um, specifically about some other approaches, specifically in the space of cross-species epigenomic analyses. Um, and the two that I'm going to talk about and give sort of some more general uh, background in, the, in this context as well, the first will be on cross-species DNA methylation imputation, and then um, the second part will be about learning evidence of conservation based on uh, functional genomics data. Um, so this first part, um, this has all been uh, led by a PhD student in my group, Emily, and it's on BioArchive, and she made um, many of these slides. Um, so this is focused, uh, this works specifically on DNA methylation. So this is um, a modification that's directly on the DNA opposed to um, like histone modifications, which are um, epigenetic marks on the amino acid residues of the histone proteins and nucleosomes wrapped around. And this is a marker that um, has a lot of relevance to gene regulation, uh, disease, and it's a biomarker um, in many applications related to aging and you hear about in terms of epigenetic clocks. Um, so there's interest um, I mean, there's been a lot of epigenomic profiling of this in uh, humans, uh, but then also now, um, I mean, there's interest in mapping it in other studies for doing evolutionary um, studies, mapping in other species for evolutionary studies or to look at um, aging or um, um, other like lifespan or species level traits and how that varies across um, species. So w one of the challenges with um, measuring or studying um, DNA methylation across species is the most popular way to um, profile DNA methylation had been um, with microarrays because this microarrays tend to be uh, very quantitative and robust for measuring DNA methylation, particularly if you're doing, um, using it as like a biomarker or for um, cohort studies, uh, you're not getting every CPG when you're working with the microarray, but the CPGs you're getting tend to be very uh, quantitative and robust, um, and it's experimentally easy and relatively cheap. Um, I mean, there's other ways to profile DNA methylation, uh, such as with um, whole genome bisulfite sequencing or various other sequencing assays. But in terms of um, what's used in cohort studies, microarrays have still dominated. But um, there's a limitation that the microarrays were specifically designed for human and then more recently um, mouse. So this led to this uh, challenge, like how could we use this microarray technology to move into other mammals if we wanted to start, for example, doing like these epigenetic um, clock analyses um, where you wanted these highly quantitative measurements in a relatively robust and cheap um, manner. So this was a, um, led to a collaboration with uh, Steve Horvath. So he sort of came to me um, sort of looking at this problem of how can we design a array to measure DNA methylation across uh, species. And um, in collaboration with a former PhD student in my group, Adriana Artis, and um, we designed a array to um, measure DNA methylation at um, around 36 or 37,000 um, CPG sites in the human genome that were well conserved across uh, mammalian evolution. So um, the, the CPG exists in many other mammals and then the way these arrays are designed there's like this flanking 50 base pairs of sequence where we've selected CPGs where not only the CPG was present but 
There is also um, a substantial number of other um, uh, flanking sequences that were present, almost identical to the human in many other mammals. Um, and then we could also design targeted mutations that would leveraging the SNP technology of these arrays to handle some divergence with the human genome. Um, so this is a toy example where um, this is showing where blue is matches the human genome, yellow, we might have a uh, tolerated um, mutation where we've designed like with the SNP technology to tolerate that mutation and then um, in red is like a SNP or a difference with the human that we might not have designed anything for and then if we have um, this enough of these mismatches it might not expect to work anymore in these other uh, species. So there could be this notion that for any given um, species we're not expecting every probe to work in it, so we'll have a set that we consider mappable in other species and then another set that um, might not be mappable. Um, so then this was sort of our count of, um, depending on what order we were, like how many of the CPGs we would expect to um, work, and for a lot of the orders it was close to um, 30,000 and at least um, around 20,000, except for a few of the more distal ones, but it's still a substantial number um, in any mammal that we would expect to work. Um, so uh, Steve Horvath assembled a consortium called the Mammalian Methylation um, Consortium where it sent um, sp samples from actually, and then over 15,000 samples representing um, more than 300 mammals and uh, 50, over 50 different tissue types, they were all uh, sent here to UCLA and sort of profiled um, on this array to sort of minimize some of the like batch effects as well. So we had um, this large collection of sort of unique um, data and there's multiple papers doing some analysis um, and with this data in terms of uh, universal clocks across species and how um, species level traits such as lifespan or um, BMI relate to epigenetic uh, marks. Um, what I'm going to tell you about specifically is a computational question that we've been motivated to look at um, given this data and that's the situation of um, where we now have data for 348 mammals in this sort of data freeze and 59 species tissue combinations, um, but it's only 3.6% of the combinations of species and tissues that are, we actually have some data for it represented in this grid of white means. We have at least one observation. Often when we have something, we have many different individuals from that um, combination. And then black is we don't have any. So the question is, given that we have um, some data in all these different tissue types and we have some data for all these different um, mammals, could we computationally impute any missing species tissue combination for these well-conserved CPGs? So if somebody's interested in what is the methylation profile in this species in this tissue, we can accurately give a prediction of what we would expect it would look like based on the existing data that we have. Um, so we developed an approach called CM impute, which is, um, stands for cross-species methylation imputation. Uh, so what we're focused on in this um, specific application now is just one um, average profile for a species tissue combination and mean sample. So given, um, like, if you had multiple different individuals um, for example, human lung, what we're trying to represent that as is like the average of all the human lung samples or horse blood and so forth. So that's what we're interested in here. Sometimes we will just refer to this as combination means samples for short for these species tissue combination mean samples. And they represent the mean, mean methylation of a species within a specific tissue type. Um, so to Zoom in a little here in terms of this grid. So the numbers here represent for some subset of 
the data, like how many individual samples we had for that combination of species and tissue type. Um, so what you're seeing here, for example, like in horse, we had a lot of samples in some of these tissue types, but we didn't have any horse brain or horse ear or um, uh, some of the other tissue types for these target combinations. Um, but what we do have to make our predictions is we have in that same species, um, if we're trying to miss, impute missing horse samples, we have for the same species, we have different tissue types. And then we have the same tissue that we're interested in, but different um, uh, species, the data for it in the blue. And then we have um, like some data black is not available. So how we actually uh, went about doing this computationally is we use something called a conditional variational autoencoder uh, using the observed sample. So with an autoencoder, um, you have your input data, and um, that also ends up being um, the output data. And you have this neural network that has a sort of a bottleneck, um, which you force it into sort of a lower dimensional space. And then with a variational autoencoder, you're sort of regularizing, or you have this prior in this um, bottleneck layer that it's fitting a normal distribution. And with the conditional part, what happens is we have specific labels which we're conditioning on. So we're making this in effect a generative model. I'll show in the next slide the predictions, but why would be like a one hot encoded species in tissue um, label? So then this would be what species and what tissue type um, you're interested in. So that's the Y here, um, the X is the input data, and then um, you have sort of the Y again in this um, bottleneck uh, layer. Um, and this is trained to um, optimize this reconstruction error plus a regularization on this um, latent layer that makes it um, effectively normal. Um, so once you've trained this conditional variational autoencoder to actually make predictions, um, what happens is you sample the Z's from a standard uh, normal distribution. Um, and then the Y's become just this um, specific one-hot encoding that you're interested in predicting. Um, and then you get your um, prediction representing that combination mean sample. And it turns out like the specific sample from this normal distribution ends up not having a large effect on the actual prediction. So this is to show um, a few results, and we have more in the um, paper. Um, so what I'm showing here right now, this is just based on the observed data. If we clustered the samples and the probes, so the probes are the different CPGs, um, that's what it looks like. And then also if we regressed out um, the species level signal and just showed you the tissue level signal, the residual, that's what it looks like. Um, and now when we make our predictions but we're holding out um, the data, so this is sort of in cross-validation, um, you can see visually there's a very strong agreement with our CM impute um, predictions, both on the original data and also if we look at after we regress out the um, species level signals. We're capturing a lot of the higher level information. Um, and we can do the evaluate this quantitatively. Um, so this is showing a sample wise uh, correlation with Pearson correlation of the, our method. Um, and then we're comparing to like the individual to individual variability. So this is like an upper bound of how, how um, good we can expect to do in a sense. Um, and then compared to a species baseline where we just average all the data for a given um, species, uh, we had a logistic regression where we provided just the species and tissue label um, for individual methylation values. And then a tissue baseline where we 
did the average of all the data for a given tissue, and a global baseline, which was just the average of everything. Um, and then, so that was on sample-wise correlation. If we also look on a um, per probe basis, the distribution of those, um, we also um, have the highest um, median uh, pairwise correlation um, compared to the, the various uh, baselines. Um, and then we also evaluated like to what extent we're able to capture quantitatively um, some of the species and uh, tissue relationships, the correlations between them. So here you're seeing a pairwise um, correlation between the observed samples and then our imputed um, samples. And what we can do is quantitatively evaluate um, to what extent can we predict if two species are in the same, I mean, two samples are of the same tissue group or of the same species group based on this pairwise um, correlation, uh, ranking them and what's the ROC curve. And it turns out that um, the CM impute got similar AURC compared to the observed data, both for the species and tissue. Well, if we look at the um, baselines, it's uh, uh, substantially worse in at least one of the two. So that's um, this work on CM impute. Now to um, talk about another uh, project that we had worked on related to cross-species epigenomic data. Um, so this is a method um, to learn evidence of conservation based on large-scale functional genomics data. And what motivated um, this is that um, the human and uh, mouse genome, um, so we have 40% of the human genome that aligns to mouse at the sequence level. Um, so there's a strong sort of prior that this location in human might be related, sort of doing something similar in mouse, but not just having a sequence alignment sort of relatively um, weak evidence on its own that it's having the same role between the species. So what we were interested in is just given now that we have these large compendium of data in both human and mouse in terms of functional genomics, epigenomics data, um, and it's providing this sort of complementary information to the sequence level information, could we quantitatively um, score based on all this human data and all the um, mouse data, what's the evidence of conservation at this functional genomics level um, based on that? So how could we do this in a quantitative way? And um, some of the challenges here is we don't necessarily have, like this experiment in human corresponds to that experiment in um, mouse. Um, so we want to be able to handle lots of very diverse types of annotations. Um, so this is one thing that sort of differentiated this work from other types of work which might have um, focused on like one specific assay at a time or one specific cell type. Here we're just taking a large compendium of human data and a large compendium of um, mouse data and we're trying to learn this evidence of conservation between the two. So we're not necessarily um, sort of, we're just claiming evidence, it could be that things are doing the same thing, but we're missing some data set in the other species. But if we give it a high score, then we want to be confident that we have um, some evidence that there might be some similar role. So how the method um, works is we're using sequence alignment to generate the training data. So we take a pair of locations in human and mouse that align at the sequence level, and those are considered positive pairs. And the features are all the functional genomics data. So you could have a vector of various types of annotations in human and various types of annotations in um, mouse. Um, and now to get negative pairs, what we do is we take locations in human that align somewhere in mouse and locations in mouse that line somewhere in human but not to each other. So it's a shuffle of the positive data. Um, so we 
have like the same set of human regions in the positive and negative, but it's just paired with a different mouse region and vice versa. Um, and then we have an uns um, so we have like two million positive and negative pairs, and we have ensembles of neural networks trained to discriminate um, these positive from negative pairs. And then once we have these trained neural networks, we can um, put these vectors in of, for any given human and mouse pair that we're interested in scoring, and then we get what we call our LUCIF score. Um, so we want to apply this to more than 8,000 human features, largely from ENCODE and roadmap epigenomics, and also some from the Phantom Consortium, and then a lot of um, mouse ENCODE data, and also from some data from the Phantom Consortium, over 3,000 features from mouse. Um, so this is a visualization of uh, what we've done here, the score. So this is showing a genomic region in human, and then um, a similar region in mouse. So where it's boxed, there's a, a sequence alignment between the corresponding locations. And then shown below it is annotations from a chromatin state model um, that was learned jointly between the species previously. So the chromatin states were defined similar as the same way across the two species. And what you can see, for example, here at the like start of the gene, this promoter region, it's getting a high LACIF score and it sort of has similar types of chromatin states um, in both species, while at other locations, um, we don't necessarily have the same chromatin states in um, like similar uh, cell types, and so it's getting a lower LACIF score. Um, and quantitatively, we could go back to the question of like how well can we actually discriminate the aligning pairs versus those shuffled pairs. Um, and it turns out that um, we can do a fairly um, strong job at that in AU RSC of 0.87 and it, it's better than several um, other baseline classification approaches. Um, and then this is showing you um, a sort of a more systematic visualization of the agreement of these chromatin states. What I'm showing on the top are um, locations that scored in the top um, 5%, so they were greater than 95% of pairs. What the chromatin state is in the human samples, the first um, six, and then below it, the lining locations in mouse, so each column is a different location. So you can see that they often have a similar chromatin state um, in human, except, and then this is showing the at the bottom the scores for mouse, um, I mean the lowest scoring ones, and you can see that the mouse um, and human in this bottom heat map, they either disagree or they're, they tend to be in this unmarked state, which is very un, uninformative, so it shouldn't necessarily score high just because it's in the same chromatin state because it's not a particularly informative chromatin state. So it doesn't necessarily give evidence. Um, and we can also uh, look at like what types of chromatin states when we look in a per um, cell type model. So this is a different chromatin state model, um, one defined with 25 states, like what the average LACIF score is. So it turns out that chromatin states we associated with promoters and enhancers um, scored above average, with promoters being among the highest, um, and also um, some repressed polycomb, while um, the heterochromatin and the more quiescent state um, scored lowest, which you might expect. Um, so to summarize, I presented um, first CM impute, which is a method for cross-species um, DNA uh, methylation, which was leveraging a large compendium of DNA methylation from the mammalian methylation array, and then LACIF for evidence of human mouse epigenome conservation. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge, um, I put in bold, uh, Subin Kwan, who led the LACIF work, and Emily, who led the semen pute work, um, and the DNA methylation work that was um, an effort by the mammalian methylation um, consortium, uh, which was led by Steve Horvath.
happy to take any questions.